From Real Ghost Stories Online.com. It's another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again. Of course, thanking you for subscribing to the show. That helps us out greatly. Please press that subscribe button, whatever platform you may be listening to us on. iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, whatever it may be. Press subscribe. It uh, helps us grow the show and you get the episodes that much quicker. Of course, uh, if you give us some love right now on iTunes, give us a review there. Then email me the username that you use. Just email Tony, T O N why at realghoststoriesonline.com uh, I will uh, then uh, send you back a bonus episode of the show for giving us that kind review so uh, thank you very much for that in advance uh, yeah hi how are you today I'm good how are you I'm doing well anything strange happened in the last 24 hours Robin Williams died yeah that was sad yeah that was that was very sad um, and and pretty shocking too. Yeah, kind of out of nowhere. But any any ghostly things? Anything paranormal? Anything? Harper put a sheet on and ran around looking like a ghost this afternoon. Okay, that's kind of normal though for her. Yeah. Other than that, uh, no. no, nothing, nothing, no. nothing out of the ordinary. We did hear some some shouting outside of the uh, the studio here earlier, and we didn't know what it was until we realized it was the neighbor's dog. Well, they that, were looking. They were for looking their for their their dog. their dog that they don't seem to understand the idea. And of the a neighbor, leash. she was shouting on our porch, but she was shouting back at like her husband across the street. And right, I that's just, always a kosher thing to do. I just hear shouting on my porch, and I think my first thought is, "Oh my God, something's wrong!" Yeah. So I go running. You know, the alarm set. Have to turn the alarm off and everything. And I like to just go over to their porch, start shouting at other things, and then they come out like, "But oh, nothing, nothing at all." I just I just want to come to your porch and shout a little bit. You know. No real reason. <laughs> it wouldn't happen if they had a leash, a, a leash or a fence. fence. They just open the door and their two little dogs go running out, go do their business on whoever's yard, yeah. and then they come home when they feel like it. And nine times out of ten, the dog will go in our garage yeah. and get stuck in our garage. I, I wish I could live that ignorantly, blissfully, as some folks do. You know? Yeah. I, I would just. Life must be so much easier when you just don't give a damn about anything that you have or possess of your own or anyone else's either. You know, it's kind of like, ah, whatever. Ah. Well, a couple of our neighbors, they do that and they their dogs are either smarter or better trained because they stay in their yard. They'll go out, do their stuff, go right back to the porch. But they, well, that's one thing. That's that's totally different. These people, know. they know their dogs have no self-control. I think it's a sign of the owners, too. No comment. Why? No comment. <laughs> I think very little self-control. Okay. Right there. That's that's what I got to say. Um, so anyhow, good times uh, in the neighborhood uh, here at Real Ghost Stories Online. If uh, you have a real ghost story, give us a call, 855-853-4802, 855-853-4802, if you would like to uh, share your real ghost story with us. Uh, some feedback Lauren wrote, wrote in, says, Hi there, just came across your show today, and I'm truly enjoying every episode regarding the particular story where the woman said she heard a gunshot just before falling asleep. This happens to me from time to time. It used to happen much more frequently when I was younger so i did some research and found that it is a phenomenon that is sometimes referred to as exploding head syndrome i used to hear my name being shouted in an incredibly booming voice crashes of different shot uh, shots or shorts uh i'm sure i'm not sure if it's related at all but some of my uh, own paranormal experiences happened following these exploding head syndrome episodes I thought that it may be at least of some interest. Thanks for sharing such a fantastic and entertaining show. Exploding head syndrome. Totally real. Totally real. Looking that up right it, now. What does it say? It, okay. And of course, this is Wikipedia. So take it what it's worth. But it it's says, usually pretty accurate. Exploding head syndrome, EHS, is a form of hypno hypnagogic auditory hallucination i'm sorry i butchered that and is a rare and relatively undocumented parasomnia event in which the subject experiences a loud bang in their head similar to a bomb exploding or a gun going off a clash of cymbals ringing an earthquake or any other form of loud noise it usually happens at the onset of sleep i think i have that sometimes you probably do. I know you've you've said at times you've asked me if I've heard something and I didn't hear. Yeah, anything. I have that actually somewhat frequently. I wouldn't say like weekly or anything like that, but a couple times a year. Um, I will have it where I, I'll be auditorily thinking I'm hearing things when I'm falling asleep. Uh, or I'll be like jolted and I'll think I have heard something very loud and nothing's happened at all. 
thunder I've, or anything or and no storms you know i've had that like jolt you know like yeah. like where you get like a, a rigor right before you fall sure. asleep I, I get that and, and that's what i get more frequently than the the audible but mm-hmm. sometimes look at the audible I'll be like what was that and i'll it'll be right at that exact time where you'd be having the jolt so there you go there's actually something to it i don't have anything paranormal that happens to me after that i just i think it's a completely psychological thing you don't have anybody ghostly come visit you in your dreams? No, unfortunately, I really don't. Yeah, boring dreams. I don't have boring dreams. I just don't have any ghosts visiting me in my dreams. Which I, I'm not. And then I'm not saying that to dismiss people who do, because I think it happens. I just you uh, just wish it would happen to you. I just wish it would happen to me. Oh, I know. Maybe I shouldn't say that out loud because I, you know, that's not. I'm not inviting anything, okay? So I, I'm just saying that now. I'm not inviting anything. You're just undoing what you tried I'm not, to do. I didn't invite anything. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just not. I'm uninviting, I guess. So, party's canceled. Uh, 855-853-4802 is the phone number. Bill Reed writes in, Jenny, regarding the theory that ghosts became demon or become demons at some point, I have neither experience nor personal knowledge about it. I do, however, have an opinion. Welcome to the club of our show. <laughs> yes. Uh, my opinion comes from having watched probably 80% of the true paranormal shows on TV. Factored in uh, is my personal belief that demons are real and, in fact, are biblical. I'm somehow skeptical about ghosts, but that's a matter for another time. The paranormal shows that I place some credence in tend to describe demons and entities that can appear humanoid, but are never human. While I hope and pray never to meet one, when battling demons, it appears important to get the demon to state its name. Conversely, it's equally important never to utter... Uh, that the demon's name. Finally, I want to thank you both for putting the show on the web. It comes across as well-produced and very professional. I'm glad we present that image. We try to. <laughs> I'm glad it comes across that way. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Bill, thanks for uh, for writing an interesting, you know, uh, thought on that. Yeah. So, uh, 855-853-4802, if you have a real ghost story that you would like to uh, to share with us. Let's go to a caller here that wrote in at 855-853-4802. Hello. Hey, Tony. I'm calling in. I'm a new listener. I just started listening today. My son uh, recommended listening. Uh, but my story is from 1989. I have several stories, but this one is uh, from 1989. Uh, this is a story... Uh, my husband and I uh, were sleeping. This starts, we were sleeping in our bedroom. Uh, back then we had a water bed, big, big king size water bed. So he's way over on his side of the bed and I'm on my side of the bed. And we had built an addition on the back of our house and made our bedroom back there. It was kind of sunken back. So the um, you had to take a step down into the room. Uh, I woke up at night and I woke up about, oh gosh, I don't know about, two o'clock in the morning and uh, saw a man standing in our doorway that led to our bedroom and this man had uh, I was woke up obviously scared seeing this man in our bedroom and woke my husband up and said there's a man at the door there's a man at her door there's a man at her door and he woke up and uh, when I got him awake uh, the man was gone but he jumped out of bed and ran through the house you know with a big baseball bat looking for the man that was in our bedroom and he came back and said you know there's nobody in the house now it doesn't look like anybody was here or oh, what did he look like I said well he um, had long hair and he had a big beard and a baseball cap on and dark clothes and he was standing in the doorway just looking at us and 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 then, you know, he left. We ran away. We were, and we were very, very shaken. And we couldn't get back to sleep. So we're laying there talking. And, you know, we finally went back to bed. We're just laying there in bed because we're hypersensitive right now, worried that there's somebody coming to our house. And my husband received a phone call at 3 in the morning. And it was a call to tell us that our friend uh, named Bush, we called him, his nickname was Bush, uh, because he had been killed about two o'clock in the morning in a car accident. And um, he, I said that was who it was. I said he, he had a big beard and long hair like our friend Bush. And, um, and, and that's my story. And my husband tells everybody now, I said, well, why did he come to see you? And I said, I think he came to see you, but you wouldn't wake up. Anyway, that's my story and very, very, 
I still get chilled even talking about it today. I got goosebumps right now just telling the story. And um, my husband can tell you how frightened I was when I woke up, when I woke him up. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Do you think uh, the ghosts that, that show up to friends' houses and stuff after they're dead realize that they're dead? I don't know. I wonder if they're purposely coming to say goodbye one last time, even though they probably really can't. That, sure. That that's what their appearance is there for. Or they're that butthead friend that's like, watch this. This is really going to freak them out. I don't know. I mean, because that's such a, a quick thing where like it had just happened and then suddenly they're there. You know, I can go with the theory of either they're they're there to say goodbye or they're so confused as to what is going on with them that they they don't realize they're dead. So they go to people that they trust in their homes and they're just kind of there and they're realizing that that some people can see them, some people can't see them and they don't know how to act or what to do. I could see it being either yeah. one. Because I could see just being extremely confused if and not, you know, realizing or or if maybe they realize they're dead, you know, and then, well, I'm maybe let's see if someone can see me. Let's walk to someone's house who knows me or something and then show up and. You know, it's weird because we hear stories kind of like this fairly often. And, you know, usually it's a family member like a grandfather or a grandmother or something coming to say goodbye or assume they're just coming to say goodbye. But in this case, were they coming to say goodbye, like, or were they coming, you know, because they're confused, like what you said? So I don't know. I've never thought of it in a different way. Yeah, I, it's it's an interesting, I don't know, theory, I guess, on on what it is. I have no idea. You know, who would be your first stop if you were if killed? If I were killed, well, here I would think I, you know, to to see you guys. Well, you know, I'm going to die before you. Well, that's what you always say. So, so I guess the girls, yeah. uh, you know, wherever they are at that point in their life, yeah. you know, uh, uh, other than that, uh, I don't know. I mean, if we're talking way down the road here, I, I'm assuming that my parents are probably gone by that point. Uh, you know, if they're still around them, yeah, you know, but, uh, so yeah, uh, you, know. you, yeah. I'm going to come haunt you first thing. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. I'm going to do a show the night, you know, just hope for some EVPs. I'll say some horrible things in the background. You play it back and your your listeners, our listeners will be like, oh my God, Jenny really said that. And I'd be like, no, I was just grunting. It's all it really was. Yeah. No, I burped wrong and it came out like an EVP. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting, you know, I, I wonder about that sometimes with the, the people returning. Do they realize they're dead? You know, that immediately. I think a little ways down the road they get it, but that soon, eh, I could see some confusion there, you know. Uh, 855-853-4802 for your real ghost stories to share them with us, or you can always uh, just write in on our website at realghoststoriesonline.com. Hi. Hi, my name's Mary. Um, I guess I'll just start by telling you my story. My mom was dating this guy, and I had known this guy and his son. He had three sons for like since I was really little, um, I'm 22 years old now. And the time, so one of the sons got in an accident and the son that got in the car accident was my age. And it had, it was, he was on a motorcycle and he ran into the back of a Jeep. And it's still kind of hard for me to talk about because it really touched me because I knew him so well. But um, anyway, I had this dream where like, I guess, I woke up out of my sleep after he had died and it was never really clear how the accident happened but like there weren't any skid marks so it wasn't like he slowed down the motorcycle and it happened in the middle of the night so it was dark out and apparently the back of the teeth um, that he ran into didn't have brake lights so I guess that had something to do with it as well but anyway I woke up out of my sleep and I don't know if it was a dream or I woke up and I saw him with a man behind him, an older man who I later found out was his grandfather. And he was like reaching like for brake pedals on a motorcycle, but there was no motorcycle in front of him. And his body was all torn to pieces, like what he looked like after he got into the accident. And uh, he was like screaming, but like, no sound was coming out of his mouth. And I felt like he was trying to tell me what had happened when he got into this accident. 
and like he wanted us to continue further investigation and I just like always his presence like a couple months after his death and I go to meeting because I'm in recovery from drugs and alcohol and um, I was at a meeting and I saw him sitting there across the room from me and when the meeting was over like he was staring at me the whole meeting and when the meeting was over I walked over and I wanted to approach him and talk to him and say hey you look just like my stepbrother who just died and like it, it touched my heart and he just vanished and it was pretty terrifying and um my whole life my grandmother's been telling me like my grandma sees spirits or she says she does and she's been telling me that I have this gift where I'm able to see spirits and I'm able to I'm sensitive I guess as you put it and um a couple months ago I had another thing happen to me where I woke up out of my sleep and I was just terrified instantly and I turned around and I put my hand out and it was pitch black in my house and I touched a face. I felt the human face, I felt the nose and the mouth and the eyes and and I couldn't go back to sleep for hours and I just felt a presence, like it was strange. And um, I started having trouble when I was like 16 years old. Um, I tried to kill myself and after I tried to kill myself there was um, this black figure crawling around on my floor and um, it went away when I got happy again and then it came back again when I was in college in Arizona I live in New Jersey right now so I was like eight away so like this thing was following me and when I was in Arizona it went as far to say my name and sometimes I still feel like I see it and I feel like when I woke up in the middle of the night that was what it was but I don't know there's a couple stories for you I really enjoy listening to your show um it makes me feel less crazy because I always thought my grandmother was crazy for saying the things that she says and it turns out that like other people see this stuff too and it's not just some big TV thing so thanks for listening and have a good day bye Mary, thank you for your call. Um, you know, I've learned a lot since I've started doing the show with Tony, it, just through my own research, but then also the calls and the letters that we get. And one of the things that I keep finding is that it's not uncommon for the sensitivity to be genetic for that to run in your family. So if your grandmother had it or said she had it, it's it's probably very much real you know going on with you and maybe even others in your family but then also you know I've found that it's not uncommon for those who are sensitive to have trouble battling depression anxiety or both that's something that goes along with it and I don't know if one triggers the other or vice versa but they seem to be paired a lot so I I don't know what to say about the dark figure that you're seeing. It doesn't sound like a good thing. What do you think, Tony? Uh, I think it sounds like something out of Sesame Street, actually. It sounds really friendly. and No, it sounds horrible. It does not sound good. But I, it's, it's, you know, it's the chicken or the egg thing, you know, with the depression. I think a lot of times, I think, that, I mean, the depression is a clinical thing. I mean, it, it yeah. a lot of times is chemically based um, and really... I think initially has nothing to do with the paranormal. I think the paranormal and those sort of things end up latching on to individuals who are susceptible to those sort of things and just end up making it worth, worse and then I think can can continue to pull people down and plague them um, yeah. throughout their lives. I believe so. So that's, that's how I feel on that. But you're definitely not crazy. There, no. There's so many people out there doing the same thing, feeling the same thing. So it's like we say, it's group therapy for the paranormally affected. Exactly. That's what we do here at Real Ghost Stories. That's what we do. Uh, 855-853-4802 if you have a real ghost story. Brett writes in, hey guys, I have a few stories for you and I'll try to make them as short as possible. Flashback about nine years ago, I was a senior in high school and me and my ex-girlfriend were together for about six months at the time. Her family lived in a nice neighborhood and a very quirky uh, uh, and very quickly sold their home and bought an older farm-style home with land and horse stables. It was a very creepy neighborhood back in the hills and tucked away. Before they moved in, me and her decided to go to a new home at night and take 
a tour. Right when I walked inside, I didn't feel like we were alone. I kept it to myself, took the short tour, and we headed home. A few days later, they moved in. Me and her graduated me and her graduated high school at the time, and we were on summer before we moved away to college. I basically lived at the house before we moved down south for school and never felt comfortable. I would sleep on the couch every night and would always hear someone walking around. I figure it was one of her two sisters or her mom or dad. Every now and then I would peek towards the kitchen but wouldn't see anyone. One night I, it walked right past me on the couch and I thought it was her dog. Nope, her dog was sleeping peacefully in the corner. Every morning I would let her know there wasn't something right in that house. Nobody believed me though. A few weeks before we moved away to school, me and her were chatting in the living room. We sat on Lazy Boys and faced each other, and behind her chair I could see through the dining room to the front porch, which was lit up by a bright light. As we were chatting, my eyes kept being drawn to the dining room. In the middle of my sentence, I saw a shadow figure peek around the corner and blocked out the porch light. When I made eye contact the figure, with the figure, I realized, and I realized I saw it quickly swooped back behind the corner. I turned pale and tried to explain what I saw. Once again, she didn't believe me. This figure was about six feet tall and was clearly a man. There was no definition to him, but a really dark shadow of a man. Fast forward a few months where we were away for college. Here's where the family jumps on board. Her father falls asleep on the couch one night while waiting to pick up her sister from a friend's house at 11 p.m. sharp. Sleeping soundly without setting an alarm, her dad forgets to pick her up. 11 p.m. on the dot, he gets slapped directly in the face. He jumps up off the couch, ready to fight whoever just hit him. He was the only one home. My girlfriend still was not a believer until she was at home for Christmas break. I was still down south at school at the time because my break started later than hers. Around 3 a.m., my phone rings, and my girlfriend is absolutely hysterical. Her dog came uh, barging into the room at 2.45 and was chasing something around the room, barking at whatever was there. Half asleep, she reached over to turn her light on that was on her nightstand, but it wasn't there. Her lamp was perfectly placed on the ground and turned on. At the time, she was living in the master bedroom, and the bathroom light and the closet light were both on, uh, with both doors wide open. She was religious about closing these doors all were uh, All the way every single night finally the dog jumps on her bed and cuddled it up close to her and the energy in the room returned to normal Since then me and her are no longer a couple but remain good friends But whatever whenever I would go to the house I would picture that shadow man peeking at us around the corner. I can say they are now all believers in the paranormal and joke around by calling their ghost their roommate. I love the show and have a few more experiences, but we'll have to wait till another time. Thanks for sharing my story and keep up the good work. You know, I was wondering when you mentioned that the bathroom light, the closet light, and then the light on the floor were all on. That's that three, you know? Yeah, it's a series of three things. I don't know. It's a creative three, it but is a it's creative a three. three. Yeah. So, I don't know. And again, it's you know the bathroom is involved mm -hmm. with the uh, the energy that can haunted bathrooms. You know, you know some bathrooms that I, I would think would be also very haunted. Those ones are along the highway, yeah, on rest stops. Maybe you know? there's a lot of coming and going there. Lots of weird energy in those places. Um, I don't know. It's probably a good place to murder someone, and no one ever knows about it. You know. <laughs> Yeah, just a thought. Just a thought. Okay. <laughs> you know, because they, I don't know. I, I always get weird vibes in those places. And if we're talking about haunted bathrooms, those are ones that I don't know. Always have kind of given off weird vibes to me. You? I don't know. I think it's the overwhelming porta potty smell that gets. To yeah, it's the always most. that's always a reason just to get in and get out of there very yeah. quickly. But uh, I don't know. I I just get creeped out because I think they're just gross. But yeah, that, I mean maybe that's part of it too. Maybe it's part of just the atmosphere itself that creeps me. Out. You know, a creepy bathroom. When I okay, when I think about creepy bathrooms, haha, my mind goes to the one at the Orpheum Theater downtown. Have you ever been in that? At least the women's has not been remodeled, and it's creepy as creepy can be. Uh, I think I've been in the men's and it wasn't all that bad. Really? No, I mean it's old. Yeah, I think it's like wood stalls that, and that building has some creepiness to it sure it's an interesting it's it's a historic theater that uh 
that's it's here in Wichita, and um, they've they've restored it kind of. Uh, and I say they're that. working on it. it. It it's through it's you know continual... private funds and everything that they're trying to work on yeah. restoring it. It's a landmark. It's a continual work in progress, um, and. You go in there. I mean, compared to some theaters that have just completely fallen into complete disrepair, it's about three fourths repaired, mm-hmm. I'd say. Um, but still, there's a lot of like the ornate, you know, ceilings and stuff are still rotting away, and and it's. I mean, that it's not an easy fix either, or cheap fix, I'm sure. No. Um, but they do keep it open, and they keep putting things in there, uh, you know, to fund it, and it's, it's a neat place. Um, but yeah, there's there's gotta be. Is there ghost history there? Or? I don't know. I would imagine there has to be. I don't know. There's just a lot of history there. It's it's just one of those buildings that creeps me out. Some old buildings creep me in a good way, and some creep me in a bad way. Is that creepy in a bad way? Yeah, I don't know why. Huh. I never got any weirdness there. I mean, I got weirdness, but I didn't get, like, bad weirdness. I don't know. It is uh, The only weirdness I got is that I was afraid some of the ceiling was going to fall apart and, like, collapse or like there's gonna be a balcony collapse in that building at some point and you're like oh my god how did this happen it looks just like something out of phantom of the opera i wouldn't i wouldn't be at all surprised if the chandelier did fall so. well i'm thinking more like the upper deck <laughs> just that whole floor just come crashing down at some point just looking at the mold and rot i mean although i, I would think that they have had some sort of structural building inspector in there at some point in time one would hope you know, stranger things have happened, though. 855-853-4802, if you have a real ghost story you'd like to share with us. Hey, Tony. Hey, Jenny. This is Tim Z from Wilmington calling. Um, excuse me if I'm mumbling at all. I've had the worst migraine for about three days. But I was just listening to your ghost doctor episode, and was pretty much forced to do something that, Tony, you've asked people to do. Pause the episode and call. Um, I've been meaning to call for a while, but wanted to call this morning, but honestly, hurting so bad, didn't want to. Had a couple things on my mind as I'm listening to these episodes. But you just covered the two things that I wanted to call about, so I'm pretty much forced to pause it and give you a buzz. Um, First of all, the question I've had this morning I've been hearing more about these lately is what exactly is a spirit box and you just slightly covered it but um, then you immediately went on to uh, talk about uh, texts from the dead I think is the way you put it Um, super quick backstory Um, we might talk about this more in future episodes but um, excuse me losing my train of thought here told you I wasn't feeling good um I lost my mother in probably one of the worst possible ways um coma leading up to a the worst possible family decision you would have to make um after she passed I would say I don't know I'm thinking closer to two months but I'd say within six months of her passing I received a phone call on my cell, um, which was the only phone I had, like everybody else of late, nobody has a house phone anymore. But I received the weirdest call I ever had and was honestly too afraid to pick it up because it, the number was a one with 10 zeros after it. To the best of my knowledge, with memory, I think I counted up 10, maybe nine, but I think 10 zeros. So it was one followed by 10 zeros. And I instantly was, you know, in my head kind of joking around saying, oh my gosh, it's a call from heaven. Kind of wish I picked it up, but I didn't. Honestly, I was too afraid at 35 years old. Um, Go ahead, chew on that for a little bit. Let it marinate. Uh, Let me know what you think. Um, Appreciate what you do. Really sorry if this is rambling. Um, It's my first day back to work. I've been in bed for two days and... Your very soothing voice is kind of helping me get back to work. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Well, I'd like to say never heard of such a thing before. It was probably a call from heaven. But But. (laughs) uh, because I, I, I do want to just not go along with everything and just say, oh, it's all ghosts. Very likely what that is 
Um, I've gotten calls like that before myself, and it's usually a telemarketer from out of country. Um, and they're dialing in. Sometimes when there's block codes put on calls, your phone will not just say blocked caller or no all caller ID or anonymous, which is what it typically does. When they're um, outside of the country, sometimes, um, depending on where it's coming from, um, as a telemarketer, it will come into you uh, as some weird digit combination or all zeros or something like that on your phone. So... I'm saying it could very well have been that. Okay. I'm not saying it may not have been. But that's your the mother calling. That's the logical possibility. That's the logical possibility. There. Okay. So that's kind of the, we think we're seeing ghosts in our house, but we also have a carbon monoxide leak going on. Yeah. Okay. You could have a haunting going on. You could also be being affected by carbon monoxide at the same time. Uh, which one is the more logical explanation? Okay, here's my... But the timing, I get it. If he never had a call like that, I wish you would have answered it. <laughs> you know, but I get, you know, being freaked out. Here's it. my thing. There's just a lot of psychological that goes into this. And I, I don't know, but part of me says, I think there's a reason his first thought when he saw that number was what, you know, not like, oh, it's a wrong number, but like it's a call from heaven. Might, sure. Might have been for a reason that that was his first thought, you know? Yeah, I mean, and sometimes when I've got those calls, I picked up there's nothing there. Yeah. Um, but then again, that's how telemarketing works. I usually dial four numbers at one time. Whoever picks up gets the call, the other three get dumped. Um, but it, would, it may just have been one of those everything happens for a reason yeah. type moments where maybe it was a telemarketer calling. But his mind went to, oh, it's something peaceful. It's my mom calling me from heaven, letting me know she's okay. And that's why all these physical and things in the real world happened. So he could have that little bit of peace at that moment in time. Yeah. Until he calls the ghost show and I debunk it. No. <laughs> no I'm, I'm, and I'm not really debunking it. I'm just saying, here's a, a, what is a logical possibility for that? Sure. Um, but... Oh, you should have answered it. If it happens again, answer it and then let us know yeah. if anything's there or what happens. I mean, because I mean, I've heard stories where people pick up the phone after someone, a loved one dies and they hear like a quick couple words and the call's gone. Yeah. I've, I've heard of that before. Um, so I'm not, it's not to say that that couldn't have been that. Um, but there you go. Yep. That's anything's possible. That's my thoughts there. 855-853-4802, 855-853-4802. If you would like to share your real ghost story with us, we would love to hear it. Let's go to another caller. Hi, you are on Real Ghost Stories online. Hello, this is Selena calling again from Woodstock, Ontario, Canada. Um, I just want to start off by saying again how much I totally love your podcast and the fact that it's on every single night now just makes every dog walk and work day fantastic and something to look forward to and your wife and you are just perfect. Um, so I want to call today and share a story about kind of how my life got started with ghosts. Um, it dates back to my parents buying their first house, which was in 1989. They bought a house that was actually only two years old, and the people who built it had only built it six months prior before moving, and there was no reason. They didn't ask back then. So my parents moved into this house um, in July of 19... 89, yeah, 89, and uh, the first thing that they noticed was the sound of kind of like a music box, but they kind of chopped it down to it being wind chimes and the windows being open because they didn't have an air conditioner yet, but the reason they found that uh, odd was when winter came and, and everything was closed, the sound of this jewelry box was continuing, so when my mom got pregnant with me, Things enhanced a little bit, and at the like the top of the basement stairs, there'd be those catches of light, almost like dust, but far too big to be dust. And things at like a child height, like a five-year-old, ten-year-old height, would be like flipped over or moved out. Just things that could be coincidence, but at the same time made you very curious. So after I was born, um, again things things got weirder, and and we were th my mom at first didn't think too much of it but thought you know if it was something maybe it's just a family member checking out the new first baby so a few of the things that happened when I was very very young um when I was first starting to crawl my mom woke up to my 
like gagging sounds and I was actually on the floor in her bedroom. So somehow I really wasn't able to pull myself up yet. I was more just able to crawl. I had made my way, someone had taken me out of the crib and taken me right into my parents' room. So um, once I started talking, I developed a bit of an imaginary friend, which, you know, was very, very common. But the thing my mom found odd is that I called my imaginary friend Mary Agnes. I said that she died a long time ago and uh, she was 10 years old. So still again, my mom didn't think too much into it until she was pregnant with my brother. And she went downstairs and she swore she saw me sitting underneath the kitchen table. I was three at the time until she got closer and noticed that this little girl was wearing a bonnet and like the old school white nighty that they would have worn late 1800s, early 1900s. So that's when my mom got a bit more confused. And it, and in a way I can say she's confused, but in another way I can say she isn't because she grew up with a lot of the same things, kind of wished for this, I'm guessing for my brother and I, not to have to go through that kind of situation. So it got to the point where at night I was talking constantly up all night and it got to the point where I couldn't even sleep in the dark. So my mom would read me Harry Potter every night and she would leave and turn the light off when I fell asleep. So this night she had turned the light off and went to run her bath and I woke up and I'm like, mom, you need to come turn on the light. And this is one of those larger houses with, with the big hallway, but you could see the bathroom. So she was rushing to my room to turn on my light and it actually turned on by itself. So that's when my mom decided to contact a local historian um, who actually knows a lot about Woodstock and, and the founding members of the town. So she had her over and they mapped out the property, gridded it all up, and found that the Nellis family, one of the founding families of Woodstock, which actually their plot is in our local cemetery, and they actually donated a road to Woodstock for the farmer's market, which is still there. So I guess the Nellis family lost the majority of their children at the end of the 1800s, the scarlet fever. So being the family that they were, they did have a picture and they were naming the children off my parents. And then they got down to the end and there was a 10 year old and they're like, this <laughs> is 10 year old Mary Agnes Nellis. And she died of scarlet fever at 10 years old. And I have to say the truth that after that and my mother finding out what was going on, that really dissipated. I'm going to save more of the stories that happened um, in my childhood and send them in again. I love your show so much. Um, I'm going to take a picture of the gravestone, the old house, um, and where it would have been, and I'll send that in to you guys if you want it. So I hope you guys are having a good day, and I love you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for your call. Definitely send us the pictures. And I don't know if you can get a picture of what Mary Agnes looked like from the Historical Society or not, but that would be interesting, too. It would be. I don't know. Have you, And let us know, have you ever seen her and, and did the picture look like the girl that you were playing with? Yeah. You know, that, I, that hits a soft spot in my heart, the whole ghost imaginary friend. What would you do if you ran across that, you know, uh, as far as because we actually tried to look that up. There's no way to look up my my kid. We tried. Well, we, it, we tried, we didn't get but every picture of every kid that died in that explosion looked, looked the sick, same. Yeah. They all could have been him. Yeah. And that was so long ago. Anyway, sure. if that was even where he died. But sure. I don't know. I think if, if I had found out my imaginary friend really, you know, like, like what she just said, you mm -hmm. know, they knew exactly who it was. I think it'd just be so incredibly sad to know it was a kid that died before their time, you know, and sure. not just an imaginary friend in my head. You know, sure. that's what made me so sad about the possibility of mine being a ghost is that that meant, you know, that he lived, but then he was really dead. He wasn't yeah. just in my mind, but I don't know you. The only piece I, I can kind of, you know, find there is that, you know, he was at least enjoying himself playing. You know, and, and you said you had good times, you know, oh, playing with your imaginary with friend. So it wasn't like, you know, it was a a sad figure constantly following you around trying to, you know, lead you to a message or something. No. It, it was just more like, let's play. Yeah. And I guess, you know, if you're going to be a, a ghost kid, that's not exactly maybe the worst thing in the world, you know, to be a kid forever and just be able to play and 
have fun, and uh, it could be a good time. Yeah. I mean, really, right. it, it really could be not that bad of a deal. Um, you know, I don't know. It's one of those things where, you know, can you invent your own heaven or something? And, you know, it, did they get the option? Did 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 your ghost uh, uh, imaginary friend have the option of, well, what would you like to do? What would, you know, what would make you happy? I want to play forever with friends. That's true. Okay, there you go. You get to go pick out your new friends all the time. I think it's such a blessing that she knows who that imaginary friend was. You know, sure. you, you actually, if you wanted to, could go and, and visit the grave. You know, yeah. I have no idea who mine was. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. 855-853-4802. David writes in, Hi, guys. I've been in two minds as to whether or not to share my story with you. As I've uh, dismissed these as rubbish for many years, I've tried to come to a logical explanation many times. Unsuccessfully, as a child up to the age of 13, I had quite a few happenings, but we'll only share a couple today. When I was a baby, my mother and father split up. My mother left, and my father and I uh, lived with my grand. When I was six or seven, I remember waking up in the middle of the night one night. I remember it was a rather stormy night. I recall the sound of the rain beating on the window. I was just at the stage of falling over to sleep. Again, when I was awakened by the sound of three loud knocks on my bedroom window. I looked towards the window and all I saw was a silhouette of the trees outside lit up by the streetlights. I managed to fall over to sleep again. In the morning, I was awoken by the sound of voices coming from down the hall. Got up, went down the hall to be greeted by well-dressed men. The house was full of people at 8 a.m. and I didn't know any of them. My father took me to one side and told me during the night my grandmother had died. It was only years after. Uh, I uh, made the link between the knocks on the window and my grandmother's death. My other story concerns the use of the Ouija board. When I was uh, 12 or 13, my friends and I got into all things paranormal after watching the likes of The Omen, Amityville Horror, etc. One came across uh, this thing called the Ouija board. We did some research at the school library, said about making one. We decided to do it in my bedroom. We all gathered around, tried many times to get it to work unsuccessfully. In the end, we dismissed it as rubbish. One night soon after, I remember waking up in the night, and I've always been a bad sleeper, so uh, waking several times during the night was not uncommon. I remember hearing the sound of distant drums from outside my bedroom window. Now outside my bedroom window was nothing but fields. The drums got closer and closer until it sounded like they were right outside my bedroom window. It sounded like there were two or more drums slightly out of sync just within the boom, boom, boom. I hid under the uh, covers, terrified, unable to come out. After two or three minutes, the drums started to fade and eventually disappeared. I was still under my bed covers, frozen with terror, but it was not over yet. I got the feeling I was not alone in my room, but uh, was too scared to look. I began to hear random noises in my room. I clearly heard something scoring along the top of my dresser. I remember the sound of my drawers opening slowly. I somehow managed to fall asleep. In the morning, I woke to my bedroom light on, and in my bedroom was the uh, entrance to the loft. This door was also opened. I got up thinking my father per, uh, thinking my father perhaps had done it, but my father was still asleep. I ran it past him, and he said I must have been dreaming. This happened again in my bedroom a few nights later, and I remember uh, biting my lip and pinching myself to make sure I was not sleeping. The following weekend, I remember having a sleepover at my cousin's house, who lives some 20 miles away, and a similar thing happened. I awakened in the middle of the night, and again, slowly but surely, the drums appeared. My cousin was in the same room, so I awakened him, uh, woke him up. He also heard the drums and was terrified. He ran into his mother's room and she came in, but the drums had stopped. She wasn't impressed at getting waken up in the middle of the night and told us to get back to sleep. I've never had any more experiences with the drums, but I've had other happenings. Being the being of Protestant uh, uh, descent and tradition, I got confirmed around the age of 13 or 14, which is basically carried out by the bishop and is required for entry into the church since I have had nothing else happen to me. So I'm not sure if it was the confirmation that stopped the happenings. Uh, I just became too old, as they say kids are sensitive to this kind of thing or what. Anyway, I thought I'd share my stories. Love the show, guys. Many thanks. Dave from Northern Ireland. 
You know how they talk to kids about drugs and they talk to kids about alcohol. They need to talk to kids about Ouija boards. Like a dare program for Ouija boards? Yeah, seriously. Uh, what would the mascot be? They got like Scruff McGruff, you know, for the <laughs> for dare and uh, the police force. What are you going to have for the uh, the Ouija? The Grim Reaper. <laughs> the Grim <laughs> But it's got to be like kid friendly though. But So it can be a version of the Grim Reaper. Yeah. You know, be like, you know, Gary the Grim Reaper, you know, and he shows up and He's got, you know, like the hood and everything, but there's a big smile and maybe kind of, because the Grim Reaper, you never going to see his face. Maybe he has the scream mask. Okay. Um, I was just thinking fun. scream mask. Yeah. And he just shows up and he hands out rulers and stuff and talks to the kids about the dangers of Ouija boards. <laughs> what would you do if my daughters came home from school one day like, hey, you know, uh, Gary the Grim Reaper came in today and talked to her class about Ouija boards. And what did you learn about Ouija boards? And what did he tell you about Ouija boards? <laughs> are we going to play with Ouija boards? No. And then the second they're out of our sight, the two of them are in the basement trying to make a Ouija board out of chalk. And what do you do when you see a Ouija board? You run and tell an adult that you trust. <laughs> I think it would actually end up stirring up because I think there's... <laughs> Kids are so unaware of Ouija boards for the most part. I think most kids are anyways. Our kids, maybe not. But I think most kids and families fairly unaware of Ouija boards, um, that it would just end up stirring up more curiosity and you'd have more people using them. I think it would have the exact opposite effect. Knowing our kids, knowing that when I learned about 911, I was the little kindergartner that went home and called 911 exactly. to see what happened. That's what would happen. Yeah, they come extra fast to your house when your dad's a cop. Yeah. Yeah, just saying. So, yeah, that would probably provoke our little ones to go play with a Ouija it board. It wouldn't work very well. No. It's a nice thought, though. I, and I, I think there could be a lot of uh, creativity in creating that character. And the rulers, the ruler business would make so much money with the. Why would you need a ruler? I don't. Because that's what they hand out. I remember getting. I had like I had a whole stack of dare rulers. You I never had, got a dare ruler. I had a dare frisbee. Oh, uh, it's probably different. You know, swag they give in different cities. Okay. We had dare rulers. Our swag was better. Yeah, our probably because our those rulers sucked. They were like they were very light plastic, and you could like. If you just pressed on them, the plastic kind of bent in. Mm -hmm. So you could kind of like write stuff. It was just kind of neat, but the, they broke. They were crap. Yeah. So, there, you there you go. And that's ruler talk for today. 855-853-4802. If you have a real ghost story that you would like to share with us, 855-853-4802 is the phone number. Hi. Hi, Tony. This is Terry. Um, you played my story the other day about the ghosts that left the bruises on me while I was babysitting. Um, I also remembered, and I didn't remember to tell you until after I'd already recorded, that when she first moved in, her home only had a small shower stall in it. There was no bathroom, and she hated that. So <clears throat> she took the utility room near the back of the house and converted it into a full bath. And so the construction, I don't know if that had anything to do with the activity that happened or not but I also wanted to bring to your attention that the distorted call that you've got I think that might have been me if that happened on the same night as the night that I made my call to you you were having trouble with your phone lines and when I tried to call it kept recording over me saying hi it's Tony Bruski over and over as I was trying to speak after it would leave a beep so I and then I just hung up and recalled back so it does sound like a female's voice, and it kind of sounds like my voice, so I'm wondering if that's what that call is. Oh. If it wasn't on the same day, then I have no idea, but if that's the possibility, then that's probably what it is. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. There was that one call. Uh, there, she, uh, the initial when she said distorted call, I was thinking of the dishes lady that's call. That's what I was thinking, not too. It. There was that one where it was like three seconds of audio or something, and it was like, oh, and it went away. And I played it back going, is this an EVP? And no, it's just the phone line not working correctly. Oh, yeah. So, there you go. You know, Logic sure takes the fun out of this show sometimes. And logic takes the fun out of everything, usually. But uh, I think it's an important thing to have. But, you, <laughs> you know, know, going back to her original story and the new information about the remodel, it, I think the only way we would know is if the... Um, the person she was babysitting for could say whether or not there was anything weird going on before the remodel. 
Yeah, that would be an interesting piece of information to have on that story. Yeah, I could see it going either way. It was either already creepy, and, and if I remember right, the ghost was kind of questionable. Like, she'd fallen asleep on the couch, and I think he had, like, messed with her skirt. And I'm saying he just because I'm assuming if he messed with it her skirt. It could have been a lesbian ghost. Okay, could have been. But um, anyway, it's it's just hard to know, but I could see them remodel stirring something up, too. That's usually what does stir stuff up is is things like that, like a remodel or, you know, rebuilding or, you know, really anything of the sort. You know, maybe that's why hotels always have activity because they're, the good ones are usually <laughs> updating themselves pretty often. That's a good point. There is a lot of uh, updates that go on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in anyway, construction sites, you have the issues. And... and for that matter, that kind of answers a lot of things about schools, too. Because schools, a lot of times, good ones, yeah, uh, tend to update, like, um, you know, as frequently as hotels. You know, about every 10, 15 years, there's some updates. There's new carpet or new paint or both mm-hmm. or something. Interesting observation. Susan writes, Jane, this happened when I was a little girl. I remember hearing my aunt typing uh, to or trying to open the door to my grandparents' bedroom. It wasn't locked, but something was keeping her from opening it. I could hear my grandparents on the other side of the door getting very upset at the situation. Finally, with all of us pushing, it finally gave. When the door opened, I had my share. Uh, I had the scare of my life. A cylindrical, bright, opaque light in the middle of the room shone down from the ceiling. In the middle of the light was a white figure. It just stood there. Then after a while, it vanished, but not before the moans and gasps of the grown-ups around me. I can't remember much after that day, but I did question the adults who were there to that day, and no one would talk about it. It still scares me to this day. I'm 58 now. Uh, love the show, Tony. Thanks. Well, if it's like a light shining down, it's a light figure. To me, that doesn't sound like a demonic entity. That sounds more like an angelic type thing. Sure. I mean, I think just the fact that they saw something like that out of nowhere. Yeah. That would be fairly disturbing and... I want to know when when she saw it. What was her feeling? Was it a good or a bad? I know it still scares her, mm-hmm. but that can sometimes tell you too. Sure. You know, honestly, that that's a, a tough question too. Because I think if if I saw something like that, it would my stomach would probably drop. Whether it's a good or bad thing, I don't know that I'm going to immediately go and even if it's a good thing, I'm going to think, oh wow, that's amazing, that's wonderful, it's great, you know, or or even feel super positive. I think my initial thing is going to be fear. Okay. No matter what it looks like. You? I mean, we're talking something that just pops up out of nowhere. You're not expecting it. I've had something pop up out of nowhere, not expecting it. Yeah? When I was little. And how'd you feel? It didn't scare really? me. Really? No, it didn't. It And my parents can verify because it went from my room into theirs. I know I've told this yeah. story before, but it didn't give me a bad feeling. I wasn't afraid of it. It felt like a very peaceful little, almost childlike spirit. And my parents said the same thing. Did it take a moment to real to like... Realize what it was, though. I mean, okay, with her story, it sounded like, bam, there's this giant bright light right there. You know, with, with an, an orb or something like, like you described, was it more of a, bam, it's right there? Or was it more like, you know, you're kind of looking up and you're squinting, what am I seeing? And it takes like a couple seconds to kind of observe and then... I guess you have a few more seconds to let it sink in what you're seeing. I remember this experience like it was yesterday yeah. and I was little, I was asleep in my big girl bed and I say my big girl bed cause I just moved to my new bedroom mm-hmm. and, um, I, I felt like something was watching me and I woke up and it was like floating kind of above me. It was just kind of bigger than an orb, but just kind of a blob of, of misty light and it just kind of floated there for a minute, and then it went through the wall into where my parents' room would have been. And I don't know if they saw it at that time or if they saw it at a different time, but they said it came through the wall and went through their room, too. And they both kind of laid there, and one asked the other, did you see that? And the other one was like, yep. So, but they said they didn't get, like, an ominous feeling from it either. Sure. But that was the last time we saw it. I think I'd be a little freaked out. Really? I don't know that I would, like, scream or run, but I think I'd be like, what the hell is, you know. Yeah. It would take me a couple seconds to feel okay. And I think if it was, if it hung around long enough, if it was there for, like, more than 10 seconds, then maybe I could be in a state where I could say good or bad. But I think initially my 
thing is freaked out. Yeah. Well, I just laid there co- for a couple sure. of minutes, you know, being little. And I just woke up because I, I was yeah. thinking, you know, I wasn't really thinking. But looking back, I was probably wondering if it was just because I just woke up Your and eyes. it was fuzzy. Yeah, sure. But it was there long enough. It wasn't my eyes. You realize it wasn't. Yeah. Interesting. 855-853-4802 with your real ghost stories. Hi, Tony. My name is Nicole Van Sherry, and I'm from Olympia, Washington. I just thought of another story that I wanted to share with you. Um, back when I was about 18 years old, um, I had a really good friend that lost her life in a car wreck. It was very tragic. It was obviously unexpected. Her parents didn't have a lot of means as far as doing her funeral. Um, me and my mom did as much as we could to help out. Back in high school, I was like a normal teen girl, you know, listening to rock music and whatnot. And I used to have this crazy obsession, <laughs> pardon me, obsession with Jim Morrison um, from The Doors. And all my friends, all my family just knew that I loved Jim Morrison and I loved The Doors. Um, my friend Tara, also the girl that passed away, knew how much I adored Jim Morrison. So the day of her funeral, um, I was 18 years old, but, you know, ever since I was younger and had experiences, but I believe, you know, I believe in spirits. And I said, Tara, um, you know, I, I miss you so much. And if you are out there, you give me a sign, just let me know. And the funeral went on and it was a very lovely service. And afterwards, um, me and my mother and my friend Crystal were gathering flowers and things and getting ready to take them back to Tara's mother's house. Um, and at the time, I was driving this crazy little Geo Metro that had no radio whatsoever. So I had a boombox in the car, you know, and it had batteries, and I was listening to the radio through that. Sounds kind of funny. It's a little sad, but that's what I was doing at that time. So we're loading up flowers in the car and getting ready to head on over to Tara's mom's house, and me and my friend Crystal get in the car, and... I was pretty bummed because a couple weeks earlier, my batteries for my boombox had died and there was, you know, no music to listen to and, well, it was a somber time anyway, so I'm sure I wouldn't be jamming out. So we left the funeral home and we started heading towards our destination and me and Crystal and my friend were driving down the road and reflecting on the funeral and the service. And it was a hot, sunny day, the windows were down and we were just driving along and out of nowhere, the boombox magically flipped on and out of nowhere it said when you're strange it's um jim morrison you know his voice came over the radio it was kind of weird it would sound like it scanned through some frequencies and all of a sudden it just picked up a door song and it just said that part when you're strange and it shut off and <laughs> you know obviously my it's not plugged in it's just a boom box with batteries in my car and me and my friend crystal looked at each other white as a ghost and we both knew but I had gotten my answer. That was Tara telling me hi. Anyways, just wanted to share that with you guys. I apologize on my uh, fumbling with telling the story, but thank you guys. Have a great show, and I just wanted to say you guys are awesome. Keep up the good work. Have a good day. That was a great story. Yeah, and that's I, I can remember folks having geometros back then and having boomboxes in them. Yeah. Do you remember any of those? No, but remember when Olivia stuck all those pennies in the radio <laughs> when yeah. she was little bitty, and uh-huh. I couldn't figure out why my radio wasn't working. Uh huh. And you being in radio, it was really annoying to me to not be able to hear uh-huh. your station. Yeah. So I had a radio in my car that yeah. was not my car radio. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. That's a cool story where she uh, came back just for that little split second. To, just uh, enough to uh, know. Uh, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, 855-853-4802 if you have a real ghost story that you would like to share with us. We'd love to hear it. Of course, you can always write it in our website at realghoststoriesonline.com. Please spread the word about our show. Like us uh, on Facebook. Uh, share uh, with your friends on Pinterest, on Twitter, wherever you possibly can. More folks are listening to the show, the better show we can put out for you uh, every single night here at Real Ghost Stories Online. If you want that bonus episode, we'll give it to you. But you got to give us a, a positive review out there on iTunes. You do that. You email me your username, T-O-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com. And I will uh, reply back with a link to the bonus episode just for you and say thank you. So there you go. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to Real Ghost Stories Online.